We on special that we're getting to you all the way from Jaipur in India, where we caught up with the who's who from the world of literature at the Jaipur Literature Festival to discuss their books, ideas and writing in general. My colleague Mohammad Saleh caught up with some of the biggest names from that literary festival. Take a look. I have with me now a very special guest who's joining us at the Z Jaipur Literature Festival. She was the heartthrob in the 90s and the early 2000s. I have with me Manisha Kwarala. Thank you very much indeed, Manisha, for joining us here on Beyond. Thank you for having me. Now, we all know that you are an incredible actor, but you've also recently taken to writing. You've actually written a book on, uh, on, on, your, on your experience with cancer. Tell us, tell us a little about this book that you've written healed and, and how cancer has changed my life. What's this book all about? Uh, well, this is a book that we, uh, uh, me and my publisher were in talks for many years, but I was never getting around to doing it. I was always pushing it aside. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> but eventually uh, in 2018, actually 2017, December, uh, I was on a holiday uh, with my family and I decided, okay, let me start recording it. So one step, another step, and then got down to jotting down many stuff, and I realized uh, it's turning out pretty well. Okay. Um, so that, uh, there you go. I mean, I just uh, wrote a couple of chapters, to, and I sent it to my publisher, and I said, is it good enough? Okay. So she loved it, okay. and uh, that's how, you know. That was almost about five years. You were diagnosed with cancer in the year 2012, and it took you five years to pen down your experiences. Was it a difficult thing to actually write about your own experience with cancer? Absolutely. It, see, see, it was always in my mind that I will pen down and I will write the experience, but I wasn't sure uh, if it's going to be a morbid story or it's going to be an inspiring story. Mm -hmm. And I did, definitely didn't want to tell a sad story. So uh, I took some time. Okay. Uh, plus, I was also um, gaining confidence because I've been an actor, and if I could be a writer or not, I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Though I, I had somebody helping me with the book, uh, but still, I wasn't sure, so I took some time. Uh, it's been pretty um, uh, troublesome, the journey, because uh, there, I mean, I'm recollecting some painful memories. Okay. And so there was time that I just gave up um, on the book. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, oh, Baba, this, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not, it's better I uh, remain actor. So should I surmise that you like acting <laughs> more than writing? I mean, because let's, let's be fair, writing is a very solitary kind of a job. You sit in a corner, well, acting is a more gregarious thing. I mean, you, you are out there and, and you're between so many people. So do you, do you prefer acting to writing? I have enjoyed, though it was a painful process. Though it was uh, something that I was remembering and I was sitting down, I was sitting down sometimes uh, 10 hours at a stretch. Uh, you know, the thing about me is whatever I do, I do with utmost uh, honesty and a lot of hard work I put in. So, um, I guess, but I enjoyed it. I mean, it was painful and it was troublesome, but when the book is finally out, you know, and uh, when people are reading and they're responding to the book, the kind of satisfaction one gets, uh, I wouldn't want to miss that. I would want to produce more books. And also, would you give us a sneak peek of your next project? Are you writing something? What are you writing? I have a couple of ideas in my head, and I wouldn't want to talk, uh, uh, but the, uh, something that is related to me, something that I've seen it, witnessed it, experienced it, uh, something out of that. Okay. I love the whole process of telling stories. I love uh, some ideas that can inspire people as well as it, it uh, you know, um, puts me on a fire as well. All right. So, um, uh, all that. Turning into a motivational speaker as well. I mean, what, what made you take, you know, this, take up this, this challenge, if, if I may so say it, of you know, yeah. motivating people, motivating people for what? <laughs> Basically, first of all, it was a personal challenge because I was very shy public speaker. Shy? Oh, yeah. You're I was an actor. A, yeah, people would assume that actors are the most know, confident know, people out that's there. That's so unfair. You know, we are very comfortable in front of the camera, but mm -hmm. in front of the thousands of people, one can get really intimidated. And um, I was. And so I took it as a personal challenge uh, that I can do this. And 
uh, I was invited and uh, I spoke well and I realized, oh, this is great and it's a great podium to speak about myself and speak about my lessons and probably I can help people because today I've gone through cancer, I've gone through many th uh, situations, though I've had great success, but I've also had great uh, uh, lessons, you know, and so I felt compelled to share my experiences, my lessons uh, uh, of life and if it can help people, why not? Absolutely. And and so I started giving slowly again. I I'm very shy uh, when I start something okay. new, and I'm um, so with a lot of um, apprehensions. Um, I started giving talks, and but I just started getting a lot of feedback and positive feedback. Uh, so uh, I guess that's uh, something that I enjoy now. Interesting. And and the other success that you've actually enjoyed is is, is your return to Bollywood. Right. You know the the role of Nargis that you've played in in the movie Sanju. That's that's been right. applauded for its brilliance. So tell us about your journey in in making your way back into Bollywood. Well, it's been again something very interesting. Is it, maybe. it is because it of is, the different uh... kind of roles that you do. You... <laughs> You know, I'm uh, I'm a product of 90s, mm -hmm. and uh, I've done some 80 plus movies, and so I have a certain mindset. And times have changed. You know, every decade the times changes, and the whole style of narration changes, the people's attitude change. So adapt to the new generation, younger generation, everything. It it is challenging. You know, one of the things about cinema now is is the new kind of writing and the different kinds of roles. Something that you would not have seen in the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with the way Bollywood is evolving in term in, in terms of the scripts? See, so even that are then, even then, even in 90s, I used to watch world cinema, mm -hmm. and what has happened in Bollywood is now people have been exposed to the world cinema because of television, because of multiplexes, because of people are traveling abroad and there's a lot of exposure. Everything is available on your phone. Absolutely. So uh, uh, automatically what's happening is the audience are also expecting different kind of stories, mm -hmm. not the same Bollywood uh, st uh, style which I love, which I've been part of it, which I'm really grateful for. But I thought it's, it's, it's time uh, to evolve. Right. Into different kind of cinema, and which is which is doing wonderfully. And you, know, you were right that you know a different kind of writing, mm -hmm. di different kind. In fact, now the performances are no, not so. No, not it's a, not about the star driving the movie. It's, it's, it's about the scripts. Which, the scripts which, have always been it, uh, mm -hmm. but still, I mean. But earlier there was this formula, you know, get in this hero, put in a song and a dance sequence. Which still happens this, now. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it does. But you have. <laughs> You know, a different kind of cinema that's also evolving. I think... And there is uh, more opportunity to do that kind of cinema. So I agree. Well. I agree. Because people are making different kinds of cinema. People are choosing. Uh, the audience are choosing different uh, cinemas. And in fact, some big hero and big budget films are not doing so well mm -hmm. as somebody with a newcomer uh, but excellently told uh, story. Okay. So I agree with you. Um, so lots have changed mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, most welcoming changes. Absolutely. Indeed. And just before we let you go, Manisha, what do you read? I mean, um, say supposing it's a rainy day and you are at home, which is the author that you, of course, go pick up his book, his or her book? I'm totally a moody, random? moody, moody person. And and uh, I go through phases. Mm -hmm. Like I used to be Ayn Rand fan at one uh, one time when I was young, and I would I just finish all her books. Okay. At at you know then then recently um, mm. because of my health issues, I've picked up uh, Dr. Andrew Wheels every book because he's a naturopath. He believes in uh, food is the medicine. So it all depends on the phase that I'm going through, and I focus. Right now, I'm focused totally on healing and health and how to, you know, um, live in balance. So, um, I'm fixed on topic more than the author, the thing I love the... So, and in between, I was reading on spirituality. Mm -hmm. So, it all depends on what mood I am in, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you very much indeed, Manisha Karla, for joining us. It was a pleasure, pleasure speaking. Pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, now one of the star attractions at the Jaipur Literature Festival is a man who sold well over 330 million copies worldwide. He originally hails from Britain, but he's been to India at least once every year for the last 20 years. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Jeffrey Archer, for joining us. I'm here it's lovely to be on the show. On Vior. So let, let me begin by asking you this because. You know, we've all read your books because I could not, when I was talking to my colleagues, find one individual who'd not read your books. Right? 
So what, what do you think make your book so popular? Do you know, it's a very strange thing. And in Britain, they've almost done surveys on it. They don't understand why. If you, you check me in the United States, you check me in Britain, almost anywhere else on earth. I run with the big authors and mm -hmm. go my way. But in India, I'm way ahead. But you're extremely popular in India. And you're more popular in India, perhaps, than, than yeah. you are in Britain. I mean, yes. what, what's happening? I don't understand it myself. Heads You Win, for example, the latest book, has been number one for the past 10 weeks in India. Mm -hmm. I think they like good storytelling. Okay. I think there are a lot of readers in this country. Don't forget, you have 275 million people who can speak English. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a bigger market than America. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the most recent book that you've written, Heads You Win, it is being said is, is arguably your best book. You said it was an extremely difficult task writing it. You spent almost a thousand hours writing it. That's over two years. Yeah. And some have said that it is better than Cain and Abel. Do you agree with that? <sighs> That's a decision for the public. It was a tremendous challenge. Uh, I was inspired by Colin Powell's mother. Mm -hmm. Colin Powell's mother couldn't decide when she left Jamaica whether to go to Britain or whether to go to the United States. And I thought, I'll bring that up to date and I'll have a Russian boy having to leave Russia because the KGB have killed his father. And his mother has to decide between going to Britain or going to the United States. But I'll do both. I'll have the same child mm -hmm. going to America, the same child going to Britain, and follow both their lives and simply show a story of how your life, anybody's life, could be changed in different situations. Okay, now, you're talking about your books. A lot of authors say that all writing, to a very large extent, is autobiographical. So which of your books most resembles your life? I think probably the Clifton Chronicles, mm -hmm. because I see myself, Harry Clifton was an author, so I see myself as Harry Clifton. And my wife, Emma, a very distinguished scientist, now chairman of the Science Museum in Great Britain, uh, I see her uh, clearly okay. in Emma. So yes, uh, they are... Most authors should write about what they know about. If you wrote a book, Mohammed, I would expect it to be about the television industry. And when I read it, I would expect to learn things about the television industry that an insider like you would be able to tell me. Okay. So I think they should be autobiographical. So is that the secret of the popularity of your books, that you've written essentially about the life that you've lived? Or do you think that... It's also to do with imagination, it's also to do with observation. Oh, I've no or, doubt or, or. in my mind that I'm a storyteller, not a writer. I've no doubt in my mind that I would like to have been a tenor, I'd like to have been an actor, mm -hmm. I'd like to have captain the England cricket team, but I'm an author. It's okay. a God-given gift. You can't go into a supermarket and buy half a dozen books. And okay. you, it's a God-given gift. You think it's a God-given gift? Now, we've got a residence in Mallorca. Yes, I have my home in And New York. you've called it, interestingly, the writer's block. Yes. Why have you called it the I writer's block? I just thought that was a fun name. Because you're a because, prolific writer. Yes, and I've been very lucky not to have writer's block. So mm -hmm. it's laughing at myself to call my lovely home in New York a writer's block. Okay, and you started writing somewhere in the 70s. And it's been several decades. It's almost four decades that you've been writing. What keeps you going? I don't know if you were at the... Uh, afternoon's meeting when two to three thousand people turned. I, I was said, listening to what you were talking and you had the audience in rapture. I mean, I should tell you, you're a brilliant writer, but you're an equally ineffective speaker. That's very kind. But that's why. When you stand up there and you see those people and millions of people buy your books, why would you stop? <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm very lucky. <laughs> very lucky. So do you mind giving us a sneak peek into what are you writing next? I've decided a lot, of write, a lot of readers have been writing to me saying, Jeffrey, we liked Harry Clifton. He was a writer and he wrote about William Warwick, mm -hmm. who, uh, who didn't go to Oxford and become a barrister like his father wanted him to, but joined the police force and went to Scotland Yard. Okay. So I'm taking William Warwick from the day he joins and I'm hoping to write seven books if I live that long, Mohammed. And the first book will be about... Constable Warwick, it's called what? Nothing Ventured, and I hope to take him, if I live long enough, all the way through to being the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Wow, so that'll be another seven books. Another please. seven books, please let me live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now the other thing that I would like to talk to you about, uh, Lord Archer, is, is about your stint in politics. Now, you are someone who was in politics, you elected the Member of Parliament at the age of 29. Yes. And then young. you made the transition into, in, into writing. Now, 
You know, Britain a few years back looked like a very sorted, settled sort of a first world country, but the news that's coming in from Britain is a little unsettling. I'm talking about Brexit. Now, you were a member of, of the Conservative Party. Are you still a member? Yes, I'm still a member. You're, you're still a member. So what is your take on what's happening in Britain? Well, I voted to remain. I would have liked to have stayed in. But the country is divided. And as you know, 48% uh, voted to remain. 52% mm -hmm. voted to leave. So the country is still divided, almost right down the middle. And the polls are suggesting it's now the other way around, which okay. kind of makes it worse. Uh, but I don't want a second referendum. We're going to be debating next Tuesday whether there should be another referendum. And my view on that is no, I lost and we should be good losers. L a democracy has been served. Mm -hmm. 52, 48, fine. We should not go on. Uh, we should get on with it. Because if, we, if the other side won, my side, the Remain side won, that we won all. What are we mm -hmm. going to have? Another referendum in two years' time to decide who's the real winner. But a mandate given by the electoral process is not for infinity. Now, two years back, Britain voted for breaking away from European Union. Now, the mood appears to be a little different mm -hmm. because once, once you have decided to break away from the European Union, where's the way forward? Are you convinced with what Theresa May is doing? Well, I think she's desperate, she is desperately the of your party. trying, yeah, desperately trying to do the impossible. You've got 48% people there, 52%, it's somehow make them all agree on one thing. The truth is there are 650 members of parliament and 650 opinions. So to try and bring them all together. But 432 is out of them said that they did not agree with Theresa May's time. Oh, I think it's very easy to get 400 to say they don't agree. Mm -hmm. It's getting 200 so to say forward? they do so what agree. So what's the way forward? I mean, you've been an active politician and, and, and you uh, would like to see Britain come out of the conundrum that, is, that it is in. But what is the way forward? We have to get a bill through the House of Commons that agrees with a policy on Europe. Whether we can do that, I don't know. And if we can't, on March the 29th, we have no deal. And we sort of go out on our own, which a lot of people don't want. As I say, next Tuesday is the vote on no deal. It'll be very interesting to see what happens. Do you think no deal is a real possibility or is it a bluff by Theresa May? I would be doing the same if I was Prime Minister. I would be saying, you can't risk this, it's too much, it's too... The truth is, it is a serious... Because the Labour Party is now saying that, look, no deal Brexit is not going to happen. It is a bluff by Theresa May to try and put us in a corner. And there has to be more negotiations that that happens. But they have to put up a motion. It has to be passed by the House of Commons. They have to get a majority. I don't know if they can. All right. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about is, is Donald Trump. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to talk about, Matt? So in 2016, you guys voted on Brexit, and 2016 was the year that Donald Trump came about. Um, you know, he has embarked on a policy of isolation, I mean, which is pretty much similar to what Britain has also embarked on with their Brexit. Do you think he's doing the right thing? I think it'd be very sad if the relationship between the United States and Britain didn't stay on an even keel. We've long been thought of ourselves of having a special relationship mm -hmm. with America. We no longer have that. That's gone. That's history. And we have to think about going in another direction. And, and coming back to writing, one of the last questions that I would like to ask you is, uh, you know, writing in English in, in the last 20 years, it's, it's just exploded in India. Where do you see this going forward? Well, it's just wonderful for people like myself. Mm -hmm. uh, this is happening all over the world because people, uh, the Chinese, the Indians, uh, use English as their second language. So every author, it's a tremendous advantage. So, <laughs> All right, last question, just before I let you go, because, you know, uh, I asked a lot of my colleagues who's their favorite author, and quite a few of them said it was Geoffrey Archer. So I want to know who is Geoffrey Archer's favorite author. I think the greatest author I've ever read is Stefan Zweig, the Austrian author, who killed himself because he thought Hitler was going to get to power. Mm -hmm. Brilliant novelist, brilliant non-fiction you should read him. The Jeffrey Arthur, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. My next guest at the Jaipur Literature Festival is Daman Singh, who is an author and who's also the daughter of our former Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh. Daman, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Beyond Here. 
Thank you for having me. Okay, now let's let let me start out by asking you about this latest book that you've written. It is it is called Kitty's War, and and it talks about the impact of the war on Indians. It is the Second World War. You know, a pro, sort of an era that's not been highlighted enough in terms of the impact that's that's happened on the Indians. What prompted you to write this book? You know, I realized very late in life that uh, India had a big role in World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more I read, uh, the more I discovered, it uh, it sort of drew me in. And I realized that this is something I want to write about. Uh, I often write about things that I don't understand. And in the process of writing, uh, I feel I, I learned so much. So that's really why I started writing Kitty's War. Okay, the name is Kitty's War, but who's Kitty? What, what is this war about? Kitty is a young uh, Anglo-Indian teacher whose father is a railway engineer. engineer and uh, they live in a small railway colony called Pipli, which I have located in okay. present-day Jharkhand. Of course, in those days it was Bihar. Uh, so she is one of the lead characters, I would say, in the story. Were you prompted to write this book because you know so much of what happened to India and to Indians, you know, during the World Wars has been underrepresented. You know, not many Indians have actually written about it. Is that what has prompted you to perhaps explore the lives of Indians during the World Wars? Exactly. I mean, there's it. It for me, it was a big mystery. You know, so everything I learned was a discovery, uh, and everything I learned was. Uh, I felt worth sharing. I, I just couldn't resist. I couldn't resist putting all this into one book and a novel, you know, mm -hmm. not history. Why, why do you think there's been so little work that's been done by Indian authors in terms of India's contribution, in terms of the suffering that, that the Indians had to endure during the World Wars? I don't know. That's hard to say. I don't really have an answer, but I guess a lot of people who are interested in those in that period, the 40s, are more, uh, say, moved or influenced by the freedom struggle. Uh, I mean, that's obviously far more dramatic and it's far more immediate. Uh, and I think in the process, perhaps, the whole question of what happened during World War II, how did it impact ordinary people, that sort of got forgotten. Okay, and are you happy with, with the representation that Indians have got? You know, when the world wars are looked at through the Western lens, because the Europeans have written extensively about it, but Indians only feature as footnotes in their history books. Yeah, well, it's it's really uh, it's sad uh, that um, Western writers, uh, mm -hmm. not that I've read a whole lot, but uh, did not reflect the fact that uh, their armies, uh, some of their armies, uh, come comprised of Indians, of Africans, people of color, basically, mm -hmm. uh, who fought these wars. Uh, basically, Britons and other peoples, other countries, colonies were funding the war. They were f uh, supplying the war. Uh, I think that hasn't come out uh, uh, in any detail. But, you know, frankly, I wouldn't sort of blame them. Why didn't we write I don't know. <laughs> you have I mean, to ask there are people. so many Indian historians who have written extensively about this period from the 1920s to the 1940s. But, but the contribution of Indian soldiers and the suffering that the Indians had to endure and, and the sacrifices that the Indian population had to make was, was not adequately enough explored. You know, I think actually it's coming out now uh, mm -hmm. because uh, I believe there are two or three books uh, on. Uh, on a similar subject which have come out in the last two years. Um, one is by Anuradha Roy. Mm -hmm. I haven't yet read it, but I plan to. And I think another couple. So uh, I think it's, it, it is getting some attention now. It is generating interest now. Mm -hmm. Now, the other issue that I need to ask you, especially considering you know, one of the movies that, that was recently released was The Accidental Prime Minister that is based on a book that was published in 2014. Of, of the same name. Have you seen the movie? No. Has anyone in your family, has Manmohan Singh seen the movie? No. Because the movie was about him. True. And what do you think about, you know, movies that are made with a certain objective in mind? Because let, let's be honest here, the movie has a certain storyline and, and it deals with real life characters and, and the author of the book also claims that this is stuff that he saw happen are you happy with this kind of cinema being made? 
You know, I'm, I'm happy with all kinds of cinema being made, and I think that filmmakers have the right uh, to explore whatever subject they wish to explore in whatever way they wish to explore. So uh, I completely respect that right. And you're a writer, but you're also a biographer of your own parents. You've written a book called Strictly Personal, Manmohan and, and Gusharan. Uh, you know, your father has lived his life in the public eye. Could anything be strictly personal so long as Manmohan Singh is concerned? Sorry, did you say what? My question was, uh, your title of the book, Strictly Personal? Ah, okay, I get it. Uh, basically, it's not a political book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about my parents as individuals, as people, as I see them, mm -hmm. uh, as, as I have also discovered them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a personal take on the personal aspect of their lives, mm -hmm. and hence the title. But in the book, interestingly, you stop at 2004. You do not write the period from 2004 till 2014, although the book was published in 2014. Do you intend to write another biography of your father in the period that he was prime minister and perhaps the period of four and a half years since? Not really. You know, uh, those 10 years, uh, so much happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is so complex. Uh, frankly, I don't think I have the intellectual ability to be able to represent what happened. Uh, that I feel somebody who is better equipped mm -hmm. should take that on. I'm not, I'm not qualified to do that. And frankly, there was nothing personal about those years. Those, mm -hmm. those years were 10 years of just hard work, you know? Okay. Uh, and there's nothing personal. He had no personal life in those years. You know, we barely saw him. Um, but somebody who has uh, an understanding of politics, which I don't, mm -hmm. somebody who has an understanding of policy, of you know all kinds of policy, not just economic policy, we're talking about science, technology, education, health, environment. I mean, there were so many uh, new ideas brought in. I honestly don't have the ability to do them justice. Do Otherwise, I would have. Literature and cinema should be used as 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 media for propaganda in politics. Is is this something that you think that India has now taken a clear turn towards? Considering that the accidental prime minister was just released, there's another movie Thakare that is that is there, and there are other movies that are also being planned on the present prime minister. And do you think making movies of this nature and writing literature of this nature is, is, is going to impact politics in some way? You know, honestly, I don't understand politics, but I, so I can't really answer that. But does but, it impact uh, electoral results? I have no idea. But, you know, one, I feel one shouldn't assume that people are just sort of gullible mm -hmm. nobodies. You know, uh, they, ha they have the, the intelligence to assess uh, the messages, the multiple messages that they are getting from multiple sources. Mm -hmm. So I would really leave it to voters uh, without prejudging, uh, you know, what impact which medium has. Okay. Now, having been the biographer of your father, do you intend to write about his life since he demitted office? No, I'm done with my father's life. You know, <laughs> I think I've done. <laughs> I've done more than my fair share. Does he intend to write something about his life post-debating office? Because he said something very interesting. He said that history would be kinder when it judges me. History has already been quite kind to him, by the way. So I'm glad that history uh, has started unrolling. I'm glad that people are seeing the worth of what he did, uh, not just in the last, uh, in the 10 years that he was as prime minister, but even before that. I'm glad he, did, he is alive to see that people are changing uh, their views. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, heartening. Daun Singh, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. It was thank a you. pleasure speaking. Thank you. Thank you.